me. Welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm doing good. And you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Now, Ormi, you're joining us from Montreal. I hope it's a little cooler there than it is here. The problem is it's so cool that it feels like we're back to winter. <laughs> well, that might be a little too much for August. <laughs> Definitely. So, Urmi, I'm very excited to speak with you. You, as a woman, have accomplished a whole lot. You're working in the finance sector. Uh, there are probably not a lot of women, or hopefully more so than there were before, that are working with you. And you've had to overcome a lot of uncomfortable situations and experiences to do the work that you do. I agree. <laughs> I agree. So the, you're in so many ways the exact type of person that we like on this podcast, because I think you can give us insight into a whole plethora of areas where you have encountered those difficult situations and leaned into them to overcome them. So yeah. how have you learned how to assert yourself in your work environment? For the work environment, I think I just... Um... I just decided to be a bit more firm uh, every time I was handling a situation. And I know that women being assertive sometimes is seen as negative or seen as bossy. But this is the thing, being bossy and being assertive are two different things. And usually when women are trying to be assertive, people don't seem to like it, but it's a feature that society and people have to uh, accept. So uh, I would say that I just started to become a bit more firm with people being less sweet because I do tend to have this, I, I want to say this feature where I tend to please people, but I start, started to put boundaries whenever I was not okay with things, saying no when things were not serving my purpose. And I think there is nothing wrong with that. And just doing things that were just basically fulfilling my purpose, fulfilling me as a person. And I think there is really nothing wrong with that. And this is how I started to become a bit more assertive, pursuing what I like, doing things that were uncomfortable and which started to become comfortable. And this way I started to become a bit more confident, a bit more secure. And I would say that I also started to um, create respect from other people because sometimes people tend to, I want to say, take advantage of you when you're like too nice, too kind. And, and I think being assertive really helped me to grow as a person as well. So I've been doing pretty well so far. <laughs> So what I heard in your response there is that you had to change your mindset about who you were going to be and how you were going to view yourself, that there are perceptions of how strong women are viewed in the workplace and in culture and society. And instead of buying into that, you chose to change your mindset on viewing that, that no, there is a distinct difference between being bossy and being assertive. And once you changed your mindset about that, then that enabled you to move through that fear and that discomfort. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, I, I would say so. And I think it's related to the concept of leadership because I would say that I, I use most of my assertive skills more at my work. And I've seen how I would work with people that were a bit bossy. And when I would look at them, this was something that I never really liked. Like you would, you don't want to like tell people what to do, but you want to encourage and motivate people what to do. And this is how I, I started to realize that being assertive means also being a good leader. So I started to apply more leadership skills when I was working team, when I was working with people. And I think it's always important to use your cooperation skills and to really, uh, like involve other people when it comes to like making decisions, making changes rather than just imposing your views like forcefully on someone because that means being bossy, but being uncertain really just means also like having good leadership skills. 
Yeah, and sometimes that assertiveness can create space for other people to bring their voices to the conversation by not letting exactly. one person dominate or a couple people dominate, but encouraging others in that space to also share their voice. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's important. I would say it's all, it's important because you're also building relationship with other people and you're making them feeling valued and accepted. And you're also getting them involved with the, by having them sharing their own views, which is important. It's very important, especially when you work in the corporate world. Now, how did that change in mindset show up tangibly in your work? How did that help advance your career? Well, for instance, uh, um, there were times where I would always be afraid of speaking up and I would never share my own view. Like I would just do whatever my manager used to tell me. But I think sometimes that's not good. Like if you always have different opinions, it's important to speak up. So initially I was like not that confident with like speaking up when things were not okay. But when, for instance, I would have the one-to-one -one meetings with my manager, I would tell myself that, you know, this is a chance for me, an opportunity for me to really just tell when something is not going well, when you know how to make things more efficient. And that's how I started to become a little bit more confident and a bit more assertive. And I started to speak out when, you know, we wanted to make some, some uh, procedures a bit more efficient. And I would say that it has also really helped me in my career because, for instance, when there were promotions, I would be like, chosen as a candidate for like promotions and that really helped me because I think it was just showing me as a as a good employee because I was being assertive I was like uh speaking up when things were not okay and also when I felt like I was deserving a promotion like I would not wait for my manager to like offer it to me I would just speak up about it and be like okay I think I'm ready now for the next step I want to know what these steps are, because um, I think it's important uh, for the company, but also you as a person, like if you work in a company as an employee, I think everyone wants to see you, um, you know, succeeding in the world. And this is also where I use a lot of my, as I was very assertive about that. I was like, I want this. I want you to tell me what to do. And I think there is, honestly, there is nothing wrong with that. And I think every woman should do that. Now, at first, I'm sure this was much more difficult than it has become for you. So what did you learn those first couple times that helped you to make this more of a <laughs> habit and an instinct in yourself? <laughs> that everything is very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was uncomfortable. And I think because we're not used to it, like I was not used to it. That was the thing, you know, it was very, very uncomfortable, like talking about this, I would be nervous when I would have these meetings because I was like, I don't want to be perceived as, you know, as I'm begging for this. But then deep inside, I knew that I deserved it. And deep inside, I knew that if I want something, if I don't ask, I'm not getting anything. So it, it did come from a place of like being uncomfortable, but sometimes we really have to get out of this comfort zone to achieve what we want to achieve in life. And I would say now it it made me much more comfortable when it comes to speaking up. Like I just, you know, recently changed uh, companies. And when there is something that I'm not okay with it, I just say it. And I'm much more comfortable with that. And I'm not worried about how I can be perceived. When, so. when I was growing up, we had cartoons that were on the TV. And a lot of those featured characters where an anvil would fall out of the sky and just crush them into a little mass on the concrete. And while we know that that's not going to happen, I mean, chances are really, really rare that we're going to be walking around and an anvil falls out of the air and squishes us. But I think sometimes that we allow ourselves to believe the emotional equivalent of that, that it's quite possible that something will just squish us. And that thing sometimes that we're afraid of is speaking out for ourselves or to have the mindset that our opinion our, and our presence matters, that if we do speak out, if we do assert ourselves, that the emotional qu equivalent of that anvil falling out of the sky is going to happen. But what we discover is that may not be the case. And in fact, it's probably not going to be the case. That especially if we are hired to work for a company, they see something in us that they value 
and everyone benefits. Everyone is a beneficiary of us sharing our opinions. Will the company go with it? Maybe, maybe not, but they are better for having heard it. Mm -hmm. And, and I think like you as a person, you're not losing anything. You know, you're like, you're not losing your job. I think it just helps you to be a bit more confident when, you know, things like that happens. And I think as a company, it's always important to share your opinions or your views about things because you want things to be better. And I think that's how you make changes as well. You know, you evoke change using your voice. And that's the only weapon I would say that we can use uh, when we're working in a company. But I, I would say everywhere, voice, our voice is I would say the most powerful weapon that we have and that we can use to make a change. And and that's how you can honestly just make a change just by raising your voice and giving voice to the voiceless as well. And increasingly, when we are a minority in the workplace, whether that's racially, ethnically, gender, what have you, in whatever way we might be a minority, we feel more and more pressured to not speak out. But I think that the more that we are a minority in our context, the more vital it is that we find that yeah. strength to speak out because we bring something, we bring a perspective that others don't know. Exactly. And you've you're experienced that yourself. In fact, you've written a book about it. You've written a book <laughs> entitled Discovering Your Identity, A Rebirth from Interracial Struggle, and you talk about finding your identity. But can you tell us a little bit about that and how that book was born? <laughs> yes, uh, I actually just published this book. It's been probably two weeks that I have published it. Well, congratulations. Um, thank you. <laughs> and uh, it's my very, very first book and not my last for sure. Um, so basically, it all happened in June that I was reading this other book that it's called How to Write a Book in 30 Days. So I read that. And um, and after that, I was like, okay, I have the ideas. I want to go ahead and write this book. So then what happened is I had this, I want to say, short-term goal that I was like, in 30 days, I'm going to make sure that I have written this book and have I have it published. So then what happened is like every day I would sit down, I would like dedicate an hour or say 30 minutes to write this book, but I would make sure that it was like a habit where mm -hmm. every day I'm writing this book. And then the reason why I wrote this book was because I feel like I was in a moment of my time where probably was the best point in my time in my life to actually publish a book because I was never comfortable with that. Like I was never comfortable talking a little bit about myself and who I am. But in this book, I do speak about a lot of the things, you know, the struggle that I went as a third culture kid because uh, my parents are from Bangladesh and I was born and raised in Italy. So I did go through that struggle of like not belonging anywhere. And in this book, I do talk about a lot of things, a lot of episodes that happened to me when I was growing up and how it was to be a woman, but how it was also to be a South Asian woman growing up in a Western culture. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and publish it. I have all the ideas. And after 30 days, uh, I had, I would say, the draft ready. Then I contacted someone on free, on like as a freelancer on Fever. I contacted this person and I said, I need this book to be edited, formatted, and then I want to just go ahead and publish it. So it was probably my biggest accomplishment. It was probably one of the few steps that I took to be really comfortable with that comfortable because I would have, like, if you asked me this couple of Years ago, I would have told you, yeah, no, I'm never talking about this. But I know that by writing this book, I'm helping other people and I'm creating a community of other women like me who shared some of these things when they were growing up. And I know that I'm helping them. So that was pretty much the whole purpose. And you understand yourself as Italian Bengali. You live in Montreal. So you live in a Western culture, but also a Western culture that has a few extra layers of complexity upon it. So if anyone can speak from this place, you have so much to bring to this topic, not just your own experience, but the many layers of your own experience. I think there are going to be many entry points for other folks to jump in and identify with how you've grown and what you have to share. So thank yeah. you for putting that out into the world. <laughs> 
Thank you. So can I get a little nosy and ask you about a few specific talents that you've had to develop <laughs> within yourself? Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so public speaking, were you a fan of public speaking? Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh my gosh, yes. I'm so afraid of public speaking. Uh, I'd say I was actually because, um, well, so the whole story with public speaking, it all started a couple of years ago when I was still a student and being a business student, we have to do presentation. This is like a mandatory requirement that you, like if you ever have to talk about a company, if you have to present a product or service, you have to present it to the clients and you have to develop public speaking, uh, public speaking skills. So I remember when I was a student, I would go and do this presentation and I was so uncomfortable with that. Like I used to hate them. I would be super nervous. I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I like putting myself into this, uh, like in, into this, like why, 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 why? So I would still do this uh, presentation, but I knew, I knew that they were not good because I would like. I didn't know how to present because they don't really teach you about presentation skills at school. You just go in front of an audience and you're just talking. And then I was like, no, this is not working. I have to do something about it. So in 2015, I joined the Toastmaster Club, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to practice of public speaking skills. So I joined it in 2015, but I only joined it for like eight months. And when I would go there, basically, I would just go in front of an audience, speak, but I would never like take the constructive feedback. I would never apply the constructive feedback that I was like getting. So I would just go and speak and go back to my seat. And I was like, no, that's it. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> and then 2019 came and I was like, no, 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 I have to go back to it because I had a goal in my mind, which was to do a TED talk. And this is because I got inspired by different TED talks that I used to watch on YouTube and mm -hmm. other female speakers as well. They inspired me a lot. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back to Toastmasters, but this time I'm going to be committed. I'll be determined. So in 2019, I went back to Toastmasters. And I remember the first meeting that we had was a disaster. I remember they called me to speak. I was super nervous. I don't know what I was saying. I was just glad that I had to just speak for one minute and go back to my desk. But after that, I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. And I was like, oh, I'm probably never going back to this place. Okay. You had that I'm... emotional experience of the anvil falling on your head. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So then I was like, I'm never going back to this place. But then I was like, no, 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 no. I have this end goal. I have to go back to it. So I went back. And every week it was a disaster, but it was me getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. And I'm glad that I did that because it's been three years that I'm part of this club. And I also took some executive role, role like VP of Education and President. And that really helped me to become a bit more comfortable and just believing in myself. And now, like, I'm not going to say I'm afraid of public speaking, but I can say that I do enjoy it a lot. I do enjoy speaking in front of a, of a crowd. And I feel like I'm even able to be at ease. Like I'm able to be myself when I'm speaking, which is also one of the things I want to achieve. Just show the world who I am and not who they want to see me as. So I do enjoy it. I go to these meetings pretty regularly. And I think being an executive in these clubs really helped me to grow a lot personally and professionally because a lot of these skills I'm able to use them also at work. Um, and it just helped me to be a very confident woman and I'm, and I'm glad of the outcome. So not only was it uncomfortable once, but it was uncomfortable repeatedly, but you just kept leaning into it and look at you now, <laughs> an executive, <laughs> and you can be yourself and you have a comfort level with it. Kudos to you. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and what about putting yourself out there on YouTube and social media? That is frightening too. Yeah, that's super scary. Um, it's so scary to the point that basically I, um, so first of all, I never thought I would have had a YouTube channel, like never, never in my life. 
But I do think uh, one of my friends who basically, she did an interview with me on YouTube for the first time. She was like, well, I need you to come as a guest on this YouTube channel. I think it will help you with your personal exposure, your brand, who you are and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And I remember being super, super nervous the first time, even though it was just me and her recording on like on a PC. But I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die after this. <laughs> so then what happened is um, I did it. We spoke for 20 minutes. She she asked me a little bit about like finance, how is it to, to work in finance and stuff like that. And I'm glad that I did that because after that, I don't know what happened. It was like a sparkle. I just realized that, you know what? I want to keep going to this stuff and I want to keep having like, I want to, I want to keep having interviews on YouTube and I think I want to have my own YouTube channel. So then um, I got invited into a couple of more uh, channels. And then after that, I was like, you know what? It's time that I have my own. So in 2022, I actually created my first YouTube channel. Um, I don't have that many subscribers, subscribers, but it's a work in progress. It's a try and an error until you find what you are supposed to be doing. Uh, but I do get like a lot of feedback. People like the content that I put out there and it's a learning process, you know, like we're not born knowing everything and YouTube, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's something that does fulfill me. And I started to become much more comfortable the more I started to do that. Um, even with my social media, like, like I remember that I never wanted to have a LinkedIn account. I was like, no, I don't want people to find out what I'm doing, what I'm working, what I have achieved. But then I was like, I do have a lot of achievement and I want to share them with the world. And I think if I do this, maybe I could, I could inspire other people to do the same. So then I created my LinkedIn profile. Uh, I always had an Instagram account as well but it was always private. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to become public with it. I just have to be careful with what I'm posting. And I'm comfortable with that too. Like I was never, never comfortable with any of these things, but now I'm comfortable with that. Cause then I think me as a person, if I want to do personal brand, you have to show who you are to the world or you like, you know, no one is going to come and talk to you or you're never going to get into like invited into podcast shows. And and now I also get invited to podcast shows as well, which is another thing that I was like, yeah, I don't know if anyone will invite me. But then I started to get invites from people and it's been like a whole year that I've been doing podcasts with people and I do enjoy it. Like I enjoy every bit of this, every bit of it. And and the thing is, before, if you Google me on like Google, you probably not find one thing about me, <laughs> but now there's so much about me that I'm like, yeah, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this because I know I, I'm putting good stuff out there in the world. Well, and I think we can trace that all of that possibility that's available to you now back to your original mindset shift when you made that change within yourself that your opinion and your presence matters. To the people that it doesn't matter, they're not going to follow you. But to the people that do, they have someone to find. They have someone who who can they can identify with and who they can learn from. So you've changed your mindset about yourself and you've given other people so much permission to lean into the difficult for themselves. And you have so much more available to you now that you didn't before. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, when you talk about like changing our mindset, I think it goes down to self-belief like the belief that you can do anything and I think that's the most important thing uh, because you know you might not be you might not have the necessary skills but if you believe that you can learn it I think that's the most important thing so um, and I think me believing in myself really helped me to achieve what, whatever whatever I have achieved so far. Well I have loved talking to you I do want to know one other thing What's next for you? So I'm I'm very ambitious, and that's one thing that you have to have <laughs> coming <me>. through. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I do have a lot in plan. Um, I think after publishing my first book, I was like, yeah, I think I want to publish another one. Uh, so I do have in plan probably before. I'm 35. I want to do publish my second book, and I do want to talk a little bit about my life in Canada. That's one thing in plan. And the second thing is that I want to do give my first TED talk, hopefully before I'm 35. So that's another 
uh, uh, thing that I have on my to-do list. And I also do uh, want to create some courses. So I'm very passionate about finance and I want to be able to create some like educational courses in finance and sell them. That's another thing that I want to do. And I also do want to create an Italian course uh, because I do speak Italian and I think uh, I want to promote more people learning Italian. So I do also want to create an Italian course eventually. I have absolutely no doubt all of these things will come to be. <laughs> Again, we are having this conversation together in August of 2022. In June of 2022, you read a book about how to write a book in 30 days. So here we are two months later, and you're talking about your newly published book. You were once terrified of public speaking, and now you are planning your path to a TED Talk, and you're an executive in the Toastmasters Association. So this is what is possible when we lean into the difficult things. You are such a prototype example for all of us who love this podcast that things are possible. They're going to be tough. They're going to be uncomfortable. You had a lot of difficulty when you were in Toastmasters, but you stuck with it. And you kept doing it. And look at you now. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us on this podcast <laughs> today. And I look forward to connecting again next year and seeing where you are then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And Any last words to the, to the listeners today? I would say, um, which is my favorite motto, is that if you want to achieve things in life, you have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable because this is the only way you can grow and be happy with yourself and what you, what you bring to the world. So this is my only advice to everyone that is listening now. Perfectly said, and I did not pay you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, thank you for joining us. Thank you.